all were hushed, and fixing their gaze upon his lips, thus from the high-raised couch Father Aeneas began. Unspeakable, O queen, is the grief you bid me renew, to tell how the Greeks destroyed the wealth and woeful realm of Troy, such insufferable sights that I myself saw, and wherein I played no small role. In telling such a tale, who or what Dolopian Myrmidon, or soldier of the grim Ulysses, could even refrain from tears? Even now dewy night speeds away from the skies, as the setting stars counsel sleep. But if such is your desire to learn the cause of our agony, and in a few brief words to hear of Troy's final catastrophe, although my mind still shudders to recall and recoils in pain, let me begin. Broken by war and thwarted by the fates, through so many war-torn years the Danaean chiefs, by divine art of Athena, had built a horse of mountainous bulk, enclosing its ribs within planks of pine, while pretending it's an offer for their safe return. This rumor abounds, but within it the choicest of their stalwart men they stealthily enclose, hiding deep inside the immense cavernous belly they impregnate that wooden womb with armed soldiery and there lies in sight tenedos an island well known by fame rich in wealth once while priam's kingdom remained but now merely a bay an unsafe anchorage for ships there they sailed to conceal themselves on the barren shores while we thought they'd left bound by the winds for my sea. And so all of Troy frees itself from long-known sorrow. The gates are opened. It's a joy to go visit the Doric camps, to see the deserted stations and the forsaken shores. Here's where the Dolopian cohorts encamped. Here did cruel Achilles' men. Here there had lain the fleet. Here's where they would meet us in battle. Some are astonished at maiden Minerva's gift of death, and they marvel at that massive horse, and firstly Timoites urged it be drawn within our walls and lodged in our citadel. Now whether by grief or by treason, Troy's fate was already tending that way. But, however, Capus and those men whose minds were wiser in counsel bid us either hurl headlong into the sea this guile of the Greeks, this distrusted gift, or else burn it with flames beneath, or else pierce and probe that hollow hiding place of the belly. And so the wavering crowd is split into opposing sides. And there first, before all factions of the crowd assembled, Laukun, with burning voice, proclaimed from the highest altar, and he was heard from far off, saying, O oh, wretched citizens, what insanity compels you all to believe that our enemies have fled by the winds? Do you really think this gift is for the grieving of Greeks? Is thus Ulysses known? Either Achilles' men are hidden here in this thing, enclosed by the wood, or twas built as a machine to be used against our walls, or spy on our homes, or fall from the city on high, or else it hides some other trick. But believe that it is no horse, Trojans, for whatever it is, I fear those Greeks, especially when bearing gifts. Thus having spoken, he hurtled his massive spear with extreme force directly at the creature's side, and there into the ribbed frame of the curved belly he impaled it. It stood there trembling, having stuck fast in the frame, whose hollow interiors groaned and rang with foreboding reverberance. And then, if the fates of the gods, and if our own minds hadn't been misguided, if he'd had incited us to mar the Greeks' hiding place with our steel, Troy yet would still stand, and you, high tower of Priam, would remain. 
But meanwhile, behold, a young lad with hands tied behind his back. He whom a band of Trojan shepherds, shouting loudly, is dragging to the Dardanian king, himself unknowing of the changing of the winds. The man, in order to contrive this, to lay open Troy to the Greeks, had surrendered himself unarmed, with his faithful mind completely prepared for either course, to engage in deception, or else meet with certain death. The Trojan youth runs crowding around him from all sides, in order to see him and compete in mocking the captive. Now just hear now of the treachery of the Greeks, and learn of all of their crimes from only this one. Since, as he stood there, looking troubled, unarmed amongst the gazing crowd, and casting his eyes on the Phrygian ranks, he cried, Alas! What lands, what seas can accept me now, or what's left of me at the end in my despair? I, who have no place left among the Greeks, when even the hostile Trojans demand my punishment and blood. Now at this lament, our mood suddenly changed, and all thoughts of violence were momentarily checked. We urged him to tell of what blood he was sprung, just how he had suffered, and what faith could be placed in him as a captive. Setting aside his heavy fears, at length he admits, I'll tell you everything, O king, all that has happened I shall confess completely with truth, he said. Nor will I deny I'm of Argive birth, and this first of all, if fortune has already made Sinon wretched, she'll not also wrongly prove me false and a liar. For here is a bit of my tale, if by chance some mention of Palamedus' name has reached your ears, of the son of Belus, talk of his glorious fame, he whom, on false charges of treason, because he opposed the war, the Pelians, by atrocious perjury, sent innocent to his death, and whom now they mourn, taken away from the light. Well, being his friend, and bound by bloodlines to him, my father, being poor, sent me here to the war when I was young. And as long as Palamedus was safe in power, and prospered in the king's council, I too had some name and respect. But after he, through the spite of Sid Ulysses, scarcely rumored, I say, had passed beyond these shores. I was ruined, and I spent my life in obscurity and grief, inwardly angry at the unjust fate of my innocent friend. Maddened, I could not be silent, and I swore, if the fates allowed, if I might ever return to my native Argus's victor, to avenge him. And with my words I stirred bitter hate. The first hint of evil came to me here, because Ulysses was always threatening me with new accusations, spreading veiled rumors among the people, and guiltily seeking to defend himself. He would not rest until, with Calchas as his instrument, but why, oh why, do I now unfold such an unwelcome story? Why should I delay you? If you consider all Greeks to be the same, and that's sufficient enough, take now your vengeance. For that's what the Ithacan wants, and the sons of Atreus would pay dearly for it. Now then, indeed, we were burning to know, and we sought the reason. We, ignorant of such wickedness and Pelian trickery, while he, trembling severely with his fictitious feelings, he continued, So often the Greeks had longed to leave Troy, to relinquish those desired walls and retreat from that wearisome war. Oh, if only they had! Often a fierce storm from the sea landlocked them, and the gales terrified them from leaving. Once, especially then, that horse, made of maple beams, stood there with storm clouds thundering the entire sky. Anxiously we sent Eurypylus to consult the oracle of Apollo, and he brought back these sad words from his inner sanctum. With blood and a virgin sacrifice you calmed the winds when you Greeks first came to these Trojan shores. Seek thus your return with blood, 
and the well-omened sacrifice of an argive life. When his voice reached the ears of the crowd, their minds were stunned. An icy shudder coursed down their deepest marrows. Who have the fates prepared? Whom does Apollo select? Now at this the Ithacan thrust the seer Calchas into the midst of the crowd, demanding to know what the god's will would be. And already many men were cruelly predicting his false wickedness for me, and silently they saw what was coming. For ten whole days the seer kept silent, refusing either to reveal his secret by words or condemn anyone to death. But eventually, urged on by the Ithacan's clamors, he broke into speech, as prearranged, dooming me to the altar. All men deeply felt this. What each had feared for himself, he endured when directed towards another's destruction. And already the terrible day had arrived, with sacred rites prepared for me, the salted grain, and headbands around my forehead. I stole myself, I confess, from death, and I burst my bonds, and all that night I hid by a muddy lake in the reeds until they might set sail, if, as it so happened, they had. But now I've no hope of seeing my old country again, nor my sweet children or the father I long for, those that, alas, perhaps they'll seek to punish for my flight and avenge my crime through the deaths of more unfortunates. But I beg you, by the gods, by divine power that knows the truth, or by whatever honor that anywhere remains pure among men, I beg of you, have pity for the soul. Have pity on such troubles of mine. Have pity for the soul that endures such undeserved suffering. Now by such tears, we granted him his life, and also we pitied him. King Priam himself is the first to order that his manacles and tight bonds be removed, and he speaks him these words of friendship. You, whoever you are, forget the forsaken Greeks. From now on you'll be one of us. But tell me the truth when I ask, why have they built this huge hulk of a horse? Who created it? What do they aim at? What religious object or war machine is it? Thus spoke Priam. And then Sinon the Greek, well studied in his Pelian craft and trickery, first raising his unbound palms towards the stars, cried out, You eternal fires and your invulnerable power be witness he exclaimed, you altars and impious swords I escaped, you altars, you sacrificial ribbons of the gods that I wore as victim, with right I break the solemn oaths of the Greeks, with justice I hate them, and if things be hidden, bring them to the light, as I am bound by no laws of their country. But you, O oh Troy, maintain your assurances, keep yourself intact, for if I do speak the truth, I shall repay your faith in me handsomely. All hope for the Greeks and their confidence in undertaking the war had always depended on Athena's aid. From that moment, when the impious son of Tydeus and Ulysses, that inventor of wickedness, had approached the fateful Palladium to snatch it from its highest temple, having killed off the guards there on the citadel's heights, and dared to seize the holy statue with their blood-soaked hands and touch the sacred ribbons of the goddess, from that moment all hope receded and ebbed backwards. All hope for the Greeks, those broken men, opposed by the mind of the goddess. And not with dubious meaning did Athena give sign of this, for scarcely was her statue set up in our camp, when suddenly glittering flames shone from her upturned eyes, a salty sweat ran down her limbs, and, marvelous to speak of, she herself darted thrice from the ground, with shield on her arm and spear quivering. Calchas immediately proclaimed that our flight by sea must be attempted, and that Troy could no longer be uprooted by Argive weapons, unless they renewed the omens at Argos, 
and take the goddess home, whom they have indeed now taken by sea in their curved ships, and now they're already heading for their native Mycenae with the wind, obtaining weapons and friendship of the gods to recross the sea and arrive unexpected. Thus Calchas raids the omen. Warned by him, they've set up this statue of a horse for the wounded goddess, instead of the Palladium, to atone for their sin. And Calchas ordered them to raise the huge mass of woven timbers up to the sky, so that your gates would not take it, nor might it be dragged within your walls to watch over your people in their ancient rites. For if your hands violated this gift of Minerva, then utter ruin would come to Priam and the Trojans. But let the gods turn that prediction on themselves, for if it were to ascend into your citadel, dragged there by your very hands, then all of Asia would come to the very walls of Pelops, mighty in war, and a like fate would await our Greek children. Now through such trickery, in the skillful lies of Sinon, his story was believed, and we were cornered by his surliness and false tears. We who were never conquered by Tydidus, nor by Larissi and Achilles, nor by those decades of war, nor those thousands of ships. But then something even much greater and more terrible befalls us wretches and further distresses our unsuspecting souls. Laukun chosen by lot as priest of Neptune, was then sacrificing a huge bull at the customary altar when, behold, a pair of serpents with huge coils snaking over the sea from Tenedos through the tranquil deep, as I shudder to tell, heading for the shore side by side, their fronts lift high over the tide, and their blood-red crests top the waves, while the rest of their bodies slide through the ocean behind, their huge backs arc in voluminous folds. There's a roar from the foaming brine. Now they have reached the shore. With their burning eyes suffused with blood and with fire, they lick at their hissing jaws with flickering tongues. Blanching at the sight, we all scatter, while they each move on a set course towards Laokun, and first each serpent entwines the slender bodies of his two sons, and, biting at them, devours their wretched limbs. But then, as he comes to their aid, his weapons in hand, they seize him too, and wreathe him in massive coils, now encircling his waist twice, twice winding their scaly folds around his throat. Their high necks and heads tower over him, as he strains to burst the knots with his hands, his sacred headband drenched with blood and black venom, while he sends up terrible shouts to the heavens, just like the savage bellowing of a bull that's fled, mortally wounded from the altar, shaking the useless axe from its neck. But the serpent pair slithering away to the high temple they escape, and seek the stronghold of fierce Athena, to hide there under the goddess's feet and the shadow of her shield. Then, in truth, a new terror begins to vibrate through each man's trembling chest, and they say he suffered justly for his sin, Lao Kun, because he wounded the sacred oak with his spear, hurtling its wicked shaft into the trunk. Now pull the statue to her house and offer prayers to the goddess's divinity, people are shouting. And so we opened the walls, we breached the defenses of our city. All men prepared themselves for this work, and they set up wheels under its feet, allowing for movement, and they stretch hemp ropes round its neck. That fatal machine mounts our walls, pregnant with arms, while around it virgin girls and boys sing sacred songs, and delight in touching their hands to the ropes. 
It glides and threateningly rolls into the midst of our city. O oh, fatherland, Ilium, house of the gods, and you, Trojan walls famous in war. Four times it sticks at the threshold of our gates, and four times the weapons clash in its belly, and yet we press on regardless, blind and deaf with our frenzy, and we sight the accursed creature on top of our sacred citadel. Even then, Cassandra reveals our future fate with her lips, she who, by a god's decree, will never be trusted by the Trojans. We unfortunate ones, for whom that day was to be our last, we clothed the gods' sacred temples throughout the city with festive branches. Meanwhile, the heavens are turned, and night rushes from the sea. Wrapping in its vast shadow the earth, the sky, and the Myrmidon's tricks. All through the city Trojans fall silent as sleep envelops their weary limbs. And already the Greek phalanx of battle-readied ships was sailing from Tenedos in the benign stillness of the silent moon, seeking the known shore where Sinon raised a torch on the citadel, where Sinon, wicked but protected from the gods' doom, sets free the Greeks imprisoned by planks of pine within that cavernous belly. Opened, the horse releases them into the still air, sliding down a lowered rope, Tesandros and Stenelus, and their, later, their leader, fatal Ulysses, emerge joyfully from their wooden womb, with Acamas and Ploias in Peleus's sum Pios, and the noble Macan, and Menelaus and Epeus, who himself devised this trick. They infiltrate the city, entombed in sleep and in wine. They slaughter the watchmen, and opening all the gates, they welcome in their comrades to link their clandestine rank. Now it was that hour when first sleep begins for weary mortals, and steals them over as the sweetest gift of the gods, when, behold, in a dream before my own eyes, Hector, saddest of all, seemed to me to stand there, pouring out great tears, torn by the chariot as once he was, black with bloody dust and his swollen feet pierced by the throngs. Oh, how he looked to me then! How changed he was from that Hector who had returned with Achilles' armor, or who had set Trojan flames to the Greek ships. His beard was ragged, his hair was matted with blood, bearing those wounds which, having been dragged many times around the walls, he had received for his country. And weeping, I seemed to myself to call out to the man, speaking such sorrowful words. O oh, Dardanian light, truest hope of the Trojans, what has so delayed you, Hector? From what shores do you, long awaited, arrive? So that I, after the deaths of so many kinsmen, after so many troubles of our people and city, might finally see you in exhaustion. Oh, what shameful events have marred that once clear face! Why do I perceive such wounds? He does not reply, nor wait on my idle questions. But dragging deep sighs from the depths of his chest, he groans, O oh, son of the goddess, flee! Tear thyself from the flames, the enemy has taken the walls, Troy falls from her high place. The enough has already been given to Priam and your country. If Troy could be saved by any hand, it would have been saved by your own. Now Troy entrusts her sacred relics and household gods to thee, Aeneas. Take them as friends of your fate. Seek for them mighty walls, those you will find at last when you will have wandered the seas. So speaks the ghost of Priam, and he brings the sacred headbands in his hands from their innermost shrine, most potent Vesta and the undying flame.
Meanwhile, within the city's walls, fear is confounded by grief mixed on all sides. And although my father in Kaisi's house was remote, secluded, and hidden by trees, the sounds grow clearer and clearer as the terrors of war assault it. I tear myself from my sleep, and I ascend to the highest rooftop. Standing there still with my ears outstretched, I strain to hear, just as when a flames attack a wheat field with the south wind raging, or as when a sudden torrent released from a high mountain stream drowns the fields, laying low the crops and the labors of cattle, and bringing down the trees headlong. As the dazed shepherd, oblivious, hears only the faint echo from a high rocky peak, at that moment, the truth was plain to see, and the insidious plot of the Greeks revealed. Already the vast hall of Apollo was given to ruin, the Vulcan flames consume it. Already nearby blazes Ucalegons, and the wide Sigean straits reflect the flames. Suddenly the clamors of men and the blaring of trumpets arises. Frantically I seek arms, not that there was any use for arms, but still my spirit burned to gather men for battle in race to the citadel with my friends, blazing in spirit. Madness and anger hurl my mind headlong, and I think it beautiful to die fighting. But behold, Panthus, having escaped the Greek spears, Panthus, son of Orthrus, high priest of Apollo, with his own hands dragging the sacred relics of the conquered gods and his little grandchild, he runs frantically to my door. Where's the best advantage, O Panthus? What position should I take? I had scarcely spoken to him when he answered me thus with a groan. Lo, the final day has arrived, Troy's most inescapable hour. We Trojans are past, Ilium is past, and so the great glory of the Troyad. Jupiter now bears all to savage Argos. Greeks are now the lords of the city in flames. The horse, standing high on the ramparts, spills forth savage warriors, while Sinon, the conqueror, exultantly stirs the flames. Others are at the wide open gates, as many thousands as ever that came from great Mycenae. Even more now stand with hostile weapons, blocking the narrow streets. A line of threatening steel with naked flickering blades is ready for the slaughter. Scarcely had the first guards at the gates even attempted to resist, and they fought, blinded by Mars. Now by these words from Orthrus's son, and by divine will, I'm thrust into the weapons and flames, where the dismal fury shrieks and growls and clamors rise to the sky. My friends join me in that place, Ripeus and Epitus, mighty in battle, along with Hippanus and Dumas, visible in the moonlight, they gathered to my sides, with young Coroebus, Migdon's son. As by chance he'd arrived in Troy at that time, burning and mad love for Cassandra, and so he had potentially brought help to the Trojans as a son-in-law to Priam. Oh, that unlucky man, he who would not listen to the frenzied prophecies of his bride. So when I saw them crowded there, eager for battle, I said the following words. Men! Bravest of all of those who suffer, if your ardent desire remains set on following me to certain end, and you yourselves can see where our fortune must lie, for all the gods by whom this empire had relied are gone, leaving behind their temples and altars, you fight for a city of flame. So let us die, and meet our demise in the midst of battle. For the beaten there is but one refuge, to have no hope of salvation. Thus I roused their young spirits to frenzy, and then, 
just like savage she-wolves in a dark mist, blindly driven by the cruel rage of their mindless bellies, leaving behind their pups who wait with thirsty jaws. Through spears in our enemies' ranks we slip, escaping from scarcely doubtful death as we journey into the heart of the city. Dark night surrounds us with deep shadow. Who could describe such a night? Who could even begin to relate such destruction in words, or equal such pain with tears? The ancient city falls in ruin. She who had ruled for so many years, numerous piles of corpses lie strewn about through streets, houses, and even the sacred temples of God. Nor is it the Trojans alone who pay the penalty with blood, for courage returns at times to the hearts of the conquered, and the Greek victors die. Cruel mourning is everywhere. Everywhere there's panic and multiple forms of death. But just then, with a great flock of Greeks thronging around him like goats, Androgeos salutes us, thinking we're allied troops by mistake. And he calls to us, too, in quite friendly Greek speech. Halt! Ha <laughs> Hurry now, men! For what sluggishness makes you all delay while the others are happily raping and plundering burning Troy? Or are y'all just now arriving from the tall ships? He spoke. And straight away, since no reply given was credible enough, he knew he'd fallen into the enemy fold. Stunned, he drew back his steps and he stifled his voice, just like a man who unexpectedly treads on a snake in rough briars, as he strides over the ground and shrinks back in sudden fear, as it suddenly rears in anger and swells its olivine neck. Thus Androgeos, shuddering at the sight of us, drew back. We each charged forward and surround them closely with our weapons, and they, ignorant of the place and seized by terror as they are, we slaughter them wholesale. Fortune favors our initial efforts. And at this, Coroibus, exultant with courage and success, cries out, O oh, comrades, wherever fortune first points out the path to safety, and where she sure where she first shows her favorable hand, let us follow. Let us change our shields and adopt Greek sigils. Deceit or courage, who would question either in war, they shall arm us themselves. Having thus spoken, he takes up Androgeus's plumed helmet and its shield with its noble livery. Livery? Livery? However you say it and he straps the Greek's wide sword to his side. Ripeus does likewise, and Dimas too, and all the young men delight in it. Each man arms himself with the fresh Greek spoils, and so we pass on mingling with the Greeks, with gods that are not our own, and in many an armed encounter through the blind night we clash, sending many a Greek down to the depths of Orcus. Some of them scatter to their ships and run for safer shores, while others, in humiliating terror, climb the vast horse again, and they hide in the womb they know so well. But alas, no faith is to be had in anything the will of the gods opposes. Behold, Priam's virgin daughter is dragged by her hair from the sanctuary and temple of Minerva. Cassandra lifts her gleaming eyes to the heavens in vain, her eyes since chains restrained her gentle palms. Unable to bear the sight of this, Coroibus, infuriated, hurled himself headlong into the ranks, seeking death. We follow him there, and with our weapons locked, we charge together. When without warning we're overwhelmed by Trojan spears hurled from the highest towers, this senseless slaughter caused by the look of our armor and the confusion arising from our Greek crests. Then the Greeks, groaning in anger at the girl being taken, having gathered again from all sides, they attack. 
Ajax, the fiercest, and the Atreides twins, and all the Delopian cohorts rush at us. Just as, at the onset of a tempest, the conflicting winds clash, the west, the south, the east, that delights in the horses of dawn, as the forest roars, as brine-wet Neptune rages with his trident, stirring the waters from their lowest depths. Even those Greeks that we'd confused through the dark of night and driven out right through the city by our deception, they reappear. And for the first time, they recognize our shields and deceitful weapons, and also that our language is different from theirs. We're overwhelmed by their sudden new numbers, and Coroibus first falls at the altar of the goddess mighty in arms, slain there by the right hands of Penelos and Ripeus, he who was the most just of all Trojans, and keenest for what was right, although the god's vision was otherwise. Hippanus and Dimas likewise perish at the hands of Alhais, neither could your great piety Pantus nor could Apollo's sacred headband defend you in your downfall. O oh, ashes of Ilium, funeral pyre of my people, be witness that at your ruin I did not evade the weapons nor the risks of the Greeks, and if it might have been my fate to die, at least I've earned it by my own hand. But then we are separated. Ipetus and Peleus from me, Ipetus weighed down by his years, and Peleus, slow-footed, wounded by Ulysses. When separately we're summoned to Priam's palace by the clamor, now here's a great battle indeed, as if the rest of the war were nothing, as if others weren't dying throughout the whole rest of the city. And so we see unbridled Mars and the Greeks rushing up to the palace, filling the entrance with the jabbing of spears and the pressing of shields. Their ladders cling to the walls. Men climb the stairs under the very doorposts with their left hands holding defensive shields against the spears while grasping the sloping stones with their right. In turn, the Trojans pull down the turrets and roof tiles of the halls, prepared to defend themselves even in death, seeing that the end was near with the masonry as weapons. They send down the gilded roof beams, the glory of their ancient forefathers. Others with naked blades block the inner doors. They defend these in massed ranks. Our spirits were re-inspired to bring help to the king's palace, to relieve our warriors with our aid, to bring some power to the beaten. And there was an entrance with hidden doors, and a passage in use between Priam's halls and a secluded gateway beyond, which the unfortunate Andromache, while the kingdom stood, often would traverse unattended to see her husband's parents, or in taking little Estaniax to his grandfather. Stealthily I followed it to the topmost heights of the pediment, from where a band of wretched Trojans were hurtling their missiles in vain. This turret, standing on the sloping edge and rising from the roof to the sky, was one where all of Ilium could be seen, both the Danaean ships and the Achaean camp. I proceeded around it, slashing at its edges with my sword, wherever the weaker parts, the upper parts, showed weaker mortar, and together we wrenched it from its high place. Falling suddenly, it dragged all to ruin with a roar, falling far and wide over the Greek ranks. But Greek reinforcements would soon arrive nor would any of the stones nor various types of missiles cease to fly. In front of the courtyard itself, at the very threshold of the palace, Pyrrhus exalts in his weapons glittering with the sheen of bronze, just like when a snake, fed on poisonous herbs in the light that cold winter has held with belly swollen beneath the ground, now gleaming again with youth, with its skin sloughed off, 
ripples its slimy back, lifts its front high towards the sun, and darts its triple-forked tongue from its jaws. Huge Peripus and the driver of Achilles' team, Automedon, the armor-bearer, and all of the Scyrian youths advance on the palace together, hurtling flames up onto the roof. Pyrrhus himself, among the front ranks, clutches a double axe, breaking through the stubborn latch, wanting to rip the bronze doors from their very hinges, and now, hewing out the timber, he breaches the solid oak and opens a huge window with gaping teeth. The inner palace within appears. The long halls are revealed. The inner sancta of Priam and the ancient kings are opened. Armed men are seen standing at the very threshold. And within the palace, the tumult of groans mingles with sad confusion, and deep within the hollow halls howl with wails of women. The noise strikes at the golden star. Trembling mothers wander the vast building, clasping the doorposts, placing kisses on them. While Pyrrhus drives forward with his father Achilles' strength, neither barricades nor the guards themselves can stop him. The door collapses under the blows of the ram, and the posts give way, wrenched from their sockets. Violence forges a path. The Greeks burst forth forcing a passage, slaughtering the front ranks and filling the wide space with their men. A foaming river is not so furious when it floods, bursting its banks, overwhelming the barriers against it, and raging in a mass through the fields, sweeping cattle and stables across the whole plain. I myself saw Pyrrhus on the threshold, mad with slaughter, and the two sons of Atreus. I saw Hecuba, her hundred women, and Priam at the altars, polluting with blood the flames that he himself had sanctified, those fifty wedding chambers, the hope of so many offspring, the proud doorposts, rich in spoils of barbarian gold, in flames come crashing down, and the Greeks take whatever the fire spares. And perhaps you might ask of me what became of Priam's fate. Well, when he saw the state of the captive city, the palace doors wrenched away and the enemy among the inner rooms, the old king clasped his long neglected armor onto his trembling shoulders, and he fastened on his useless sword and hurried into the thick of the enemy seeking death. In the center of the halls, under the sky's bare arch, was an immense altar, with an ancient laurel nearby that leant on the altar and clothed the household gods with its shade. Now here Hecuba and her daughters were gathered around the altars, just like a flock of doves driven to shelter by a dark storm. They huddled there together, crouching uselessly under the divine shrine. As soon as she saw Priam himself dressed in his youthful armor, she cried out, What mad thought, poor husband, urges you to fasten on such weapons? For where do you run? The hour demands no such help, nor such defenses as these, not even if my own Hector were here himself. Hide here with us, I beg you. Either this altar will protect us all, or else we'll die together. Thus her lips made utterance, and she drew the old man towards her and set him down on the sacred steps. Now behold, Polites, one of Priam's sons, escaping from Pyrrhus's slaughter, he runs down the long hallways through enemies and spears, and, wounded, he flees through the empty courtyards. Pyrrhus chases after him, eager to strike him, grasping at him now and again with his hand at spear point, when finally he'd reached the eyes and gaze of his parents, he fell slain and poured out his life in a river of blood. Priam, though even now already in the clutches of death, did not spare his voice at this, nor hold back his anger. For such wickedness, he cried, for such sin, 
May the gods, if there be justice in heaven that cares for such things, with a kind thanks and fitting reward repay you, you who have made me see my own son's death in front of my face and defiled a father's sight with slaughter. Not even Achilles, whose son you falsely claim to be, was ever such an enemy to Priam, for he respected the laws of faith and the suppliant's rights. He returned Hector's bloodless corpse to its tomb, and he sent me home to my kingdom. <clears throat> Thus having spoken, the old man threw his ineffectual spear completely without strength which immediately spun from the clanging bronze and hung there uselessly, suspended from the center of the shield. Pyrrhus then spoke to him. So then, you can be messenger, carry the news to my father, to Peleus's son. Remember to tell him of degenerate Pyrrhus and of all my pitiful deeds. Now, die. Saying this, he dragged Priam, trembling and slithering in the pool of his own son's blood, to that very altar, and, twining his left hand in the king's hair, and raising in his right the glittering sword, he buried it to the hilt in the old man's side. This was the end of Priam's life. This was the death that fell to him by chance seeing Troy ablaze and its citadel toppled, he who once was ruler over so many Asian lands and peoples. A once mighty body now lies on the shore, the head torn from its shoulders, a corpse without a name. And then, for the very first time, a wild terror overcame me. I stood amazed, as my dear father's image rose before me. I saw a king of like age, with a cruel wound exposed, breathing away his life. In my Croisa, my wife, forlorn, and our ransacked house, and the fate of my little Eulus, I looked back. I considered the troops that were just around me. They had all left. They abandoned me wearied and hurtled their bodies to the earth, dropping dead with misery among the flames. And now I thought I was alone, when nearby Vesta's sacred threshold, hiding silently in the shrine, I see Helen, the daughter of Tyndareus. The bright flames give me sight, as my eyes wandered, gazing everywhere, randomly searching, Afraid of Trojans, angered at the fall of Troy, and of Greek vengeance, and the fury of a husband she deserted. And she also, fearing the mutual curse of Troy and her own Erinus, had concealed herself, a hated thing, and crouched there by the altars. Fire blazed in my spirit, anger arose for avenging my fallen land, and to exact punishment for her wickedness. Shall she be allowed, unharmed, to see Sparta again, and her native Mycenae, and to go in the triumphant role of a queen, to see her house and husband, parents and children again, attended by a crowd of Trojan women and Phrygian slaves, when Priam has been put to the sword, with Troy consumed by flames, Dardanian shore soaked again and again with blood? No, though there is no glory in a woman's punishment, and such a conquest wins no praise, yet still I will be praised for extinguishing her wickedness and exacting the well-earned vengeance, and I will delight in filling my soul with the flames of revenge and in appeasing my people's ashes. I blurted out these words. I was raging on with a frenzied mind when she herself came to me in a vision, never before so clear to my eyes, gleaming forth with pure light through the night. My dear mother Venus appeared to me as truly as she may ever be seen by the gods, as she's accustomed. And then taking me by my right hand, she stopped me there and imparted these words from her rose-tinted lips. 
O oh, son, what grief stirs in thee such insatiable anger? Why rageth thou, if has thy concern for what's ours vanished? Will you not see first where you've left your father, Anchises, worn out with age, or whether Croesa, your wife, and your son Ascanius still live? Those whom Greek ranks surround on all sides, and if my love did not protect them, already now flames would have caught them and enemy swords drank of their blood. You do not hate the face of the Spartan daughter of Tyndareus, nor is Paris to blame for that. The ruthlessness of the gods, of the gods, brought down this power, and have toppled Troy from its heights. Behold, for I'll tear away all the mist that now, shrouding your vision, dims your mortal sight and darkens all things with dew. For don't be afraid of what your mother commands, nor refuse to obey her wisdom. Here where you see shattered heaps of stone, torn from stone, and billowing smoke mixed with dust, Neptune is shaking the walls, and the very foundations stirred by his trident, tearing the whole city up from its roots. There then Juno the fiercest is first to take the Scian gate, and with her sword at her side she calls on the troops from the ships in a raid. Now behold Tritonian Pallas, standing on the highest towers, sending down lightning from the clouds, wearing her grim gorgon breastplate. Father Jupiter himself supplies the Greeks with courage and fortunate strength, himself exciting the gods against the Trojans. Hurry, son, flee, put an end to your efforts. I shall never leave you. I will place you safe at your father's door. She spoke, and hid herself in the dense shadows of night. Dreadful shapes then appeared, the vast powers of the gods opposed to Troy. <clears throat> then, in truth, all Ilium seemed to me to sink into flames and Neptune's Troy was toppled from her base, just as when lumberjacks on the mountain heights compete to uproot an ancient ash tree, struck time and again by axe and blade, as it threatens continually to fall with trembling foliage and shivering crown, until, gradually vanquished by the blows, it groans at last, and, torn from the ridge, comes crashing down in ruin. I descend, and led by the goddess, from flames and from enemies I escape. The spears give way, and the flames recede. And now when I had reached the threshold of my father's house, my former home, my father whom it was my first desire to carry into the mountains, and whom I first sought out, he stubbornly refused to extend his life or endure exile, since Troy had fallen. O oh, you whose blood has the vigor of youth, he cried, and whose power is unimpaired in its force, it's for you to take flight. As for me, if the gods had wished to lengthen the thread of my life, they'd have spared my house. It is more than enough that I saw one destruction surviving one taking of the city. Depart now, say farewell to my body lying here just so. I shall find death with my own hand. The enemy will pity me and look for plunder. The loss of my burial is nothing. Clinging to old age for so very long, I am useless, hated by the gods ever since the father of them and the ruler of men breathed the winds of his lightning into me and touched me with his flames. So my father persisted in saying and remained adamant. But we, on our part, Croesa, my wife, Ascanius, my son, and all of our household slaves, weeping bitterly, we determined that he should not destroy everything along with himself and crush us by urging our doom. Yet he refused, and he clung to his place and his purpose. And so I hurried to my weapons again, and miserably I longed for death, since what tactic or opportunity was open to me then? 
Did you think that I could just leave you, father, and depart? Did such sinful words just fall from your lips? If it pleases the gods to leave nothing of our great city standing, if this is set in your mind, if it delights you to add yourself and all that's yours to the ruin of Troy, then the door is open to that death. Soon Pyrrhus comes, drenched in Priam's blood, he who butchers the son in front of the father, and the father at the altar. Kind mother Venus, did you rescue me from fire and from sword for this, to see the enemy in the depths of my home, and Ascanius and my father and Croesus slaughtered, thrown together in a heap of one another's blood? Weapons, men, fetch weapons! The last day calls to the defeated. Lead me to the Greeks again, let me revisit the battle anew, for this day we shall not all perish unavenged. And so, again I fasten on my sword, I slip my left arm into the shield strap, I briefly adjust it, and then rush from the house. But behold my wife, clinging to the threshold, clasping my foot, and holding little Eulus up towards his father. If you go to die, take us with you too, at all costs, she cried. But if, as you've proved, you trust in the weapons you wear, defend this house first. To whom do you abandon little Eulus and your father and me, I who was once spoken of as your wife? Crying out like this, she filled the whole house with her wails, when suddenly a wonder, marvelous to speak of, occurred. Behold, between the hands and faces of his grieving parents, a gentle light seemed to shine from the crown of little Eulus's head, and a soft flame, harmless in its touch, licked at his hair and grazed his forehead. Trembling with fear, we hurried to flick away the blazing strands and extinguish the sacred fires with water. But Anchises, my father, lifting his eyes to the heavens in delight, raising his hands and voice to the sky, All power for Jupiter, if you're moved by any prayers, see us and grant us but this, if we are worthy through our virtue, show us a sign of it, father and confirm your omens." The old man scarcely had spoken, when a sudden crash thundered from the left, and a star slid through the darkness from the sky, and flew, trailing fire in a burst of light. We watched it glide over the highest rooftops, and we saw it bury its brightness in the forests of Ida, and the sign of its passage. Then the furrow of its long track gave out a glow, and all around the place smelt of sulphur. At this my father, truly overcome, raised himself towards the sky and proclaimed to the gods, adoring the sacred star. Now, now, no delay, I'll follow, and wherever you lead, there I'll be. Gods of my fathers, save my line, save my grandson. This omen is yours. Troy is in your divine power. I cannot decline, my son, nor will I refuse to go with you. He spoke, and now much clearer through the walls the flames are audible, and the fire rolls its hot tide nearer. Come then, dear father, clasp on to my neck. I will carry you on my shoulders, nor does that task weigh me down. Whatever happens, let it be for us both the same shared risk and the same salvation. Let little Eulus come with me, and let my wife follow our footsteps at a distance. You, slaves, turn your attention to what I say. For at the entrance to the city is a mound, an ancient tomb of forsaken Ceres, and a venerable cypress nearby, protected through the years by the reverence of our fathers. Let us go there by diverse paths to that one place. You, father, take the sacred relics of our country's gods, for it would be a sin for me to touch them with hands coming from such fighting and recent slaughter until I've washed my whole being in running water. So speaking, I bowed my head and my whole neck beneath my shoulders, over which I'd spread a cloak made of a tawny lion's hide, and bent to the task. 
Little Euless clasps his hands in mine and follows his father's footsteps with unequaled strides. My wife walks behind us. We carry on walking through shadows of places, and I, whom until then had not been moved by any shower of spears hurtled, nor by a crowd of Greeks in hostile array, yet then I'm terrified by the slightest breeze, I'm startled by every noise, anxious and fearful equally for my companions and for my burden. But now I was near the gates and thought I'd completed my journey, when suddenly the sound of approaching feet filled my ears, and peering through the darkness my father cried, My son, run, my son, they're coming! I see their glittering shields and gleaming bronze. Now some hostile power at this must have scattered my muddled wits and hijacked my mind. For while I was following alleyways and straying from the region of streets that we knew well, did my wife Croesa halt, snatched away from me by wretched fate? Or did she wander from the path or collapse with exhaustion? Who knows, for she was never restored to our sight. Neither did I look back for my lost wife nor cast a thought behind me until we'd come to that mound, at ancient Ceres' resting place. Here, when all were gathered together, at last just one was missing, having escaped the notice of friends, child, and husband alike. What men or what gods did I not accuse in my madness? For what had I seen in the fall of my city any crueler than this? Alas, I placed Ascanius and my father Anchises and the gods of Troy in my companion's care, concealing them in a winding valley. And I sought the city once more. I take up my shining armor, determined to incur every risk again, to retrace my steps through all of Ilium, and again expose my life to danger. First I looked for the wall in the dark threshold of the gate from which my path led, and I retraced the landmarks of my course in the night, scanning them with my gaze. Everywhere the terror in my heart and the silence itself dismay me. Then I took myself homewards, in case by chance, by some chance, she waits for me there. Already the Greeks had invaded and occupied the whole house. Suddenly, eager fire rolls up to the rooftop. In the wind, the flames take hold, and the blaze rages to the skies. I pass by. I see again Priam's palace in the citadel. Now Phoenix and fatal Ulysses, the chosen guards, they watch over the spoils in the empty courts of Juno's sanctuary. Here the Trojan treasures are gathered from all parts, ripped from the blazing shrines, tables of the gods, solid gold bowls, and plundered robes. Mothers and trembling sons stand round in long ranks. I even dared to hurl my shouts through the shadows, filling the streets with my clamor, and in my misery redoubling my useless cries again and again, searching raging endlessly among the city roofs. The unhappy ghost and true shadow of Croesa then appeared before my eyes, in a form greater than I'd known. I was dumbstruck. My hair stood on end, and my voice stuck in my throat. Then she spoke, and with these words mitigated my distress. O oh, sweet husband, what use is it to indulge in such mad grief? This has not happened without the divine will. Neither its laws nor the ruler of great Olympus will let you take Croesa with you. Yours is a long exile. You must plow a vast reach of sea. And you will come to Hesperian land, where the Lydian Tiber flows in gentle course among the farmer's rich fields. Here happiness, kingship, and a royal wife will be yours. Put away these tears for your beloved Croesa. 
I shall never see the noble halls of the Delopians or Myrmidons, nor will I go as a slave to war to some Greek wife. Instead, I, a woman of Troy, daughter-in-law to divine Venus, instead the great mother of the gods keeps me here on these shores. And now farewell. Preserve your love for the son we share. And when she had spoken these words, leaving me alone, weeping, and wanting to say so many things, she faded into thin air. Three times I tried to throw my arms around her neck, and three times her form fled my hands, clasping in vain, like the light breeze, or most of all like a winged dream. When at last, when night was consumed, I returned to my friends. And now, amazed, I discovered that a great number of new companions had streamed in, both women and men, a crowd gathering for exile, a deplorable throng. They had gathered from all sides, ready with courage and with wealth, for whatever lands I wished to lead them across the sea. And now Lucifer was rising above the heights of sacred Ida, bringing in the dawn, and the Greeks held the barricaded entrance to the gates. Nor was there any hope of respite. And so I quit the place, and bearing my father, I took to the hills. <laughs>